thought this might be an easy See my head on the floor. Thank you very much. All right, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Dagny Ulrich, as she said, I'm a pharmacy resident. And today I'm going to talk about some anticoagulants and their uses. So some of the different anticoagulants that we use are Lovenox, Heparin, Erixtra, Warfarin, and Xeralto. So this is just an overview of the clotting cascade. And this is just to show you that the different anticoagulation agents work at different points in this um, clotting cascade. And I just want to point out, because sometimes people get this wrong, that antiplatelet agents, um, aspirin, Plavix, Berlinta, these are not um, DVT prophylaxis. They're not anti-clotting agents. They're um, antiplatelet agents. So we'll see this figure again throughout the talk um, when we focus on each one of these agents. So some common conditions that require anticoagulation, um, you'll see preventing clots from forming. This is typically from a situation with AFib or a flutter, heart valve replacement, or after certain surgeries, such as knee or hip replacement surgeries. Um, you also see anticoagulation used to treat existing clots, such as a DVT, a deep vein thrombosis, or pulmonary embolism, or PE. So um, for DVTs and AFib, just to kind of go through the pathophysiology of some of the things that we're worried about. If you have a clot arising from the heart in AFib, where does it go? Where are we worried about it going? Heart, lungs, and head. It's going to go to your brain or also possibly to your heart. It can cause an MI or a stroke. Um, for a clot arising in your leg or a DVT, where are we worried about that going? that's going to go to the lung. So that's when we're worried about preventing um, a pulmonary embolism or a PE. So to talk a little bit more about um, AFib or a flutter, our goal is to prevent a clot from forming. Um, and as we just mentioned, if you have AFib, you have an increased risk of stroke or MI. And this risk is assessed by something called the CHADS-2 VAS score, um, where the higher the risk, the stronger the indication for warfarin. And so some of the factors that go into this score um, are patient comorbidities and um, factors such as age and gender. So for each of these things, you have one point except for a prior stroke or TIA, and that's two points. And so just some things to make note of, um, CHF is one point, hypertension is one point, um, age above 75 is one point, and then they would get an additional point from the age above 65 to 74 as well. So really, if they're over 75, it's like two points. Is um, that pharmacy's responsibility to figure that, or do y'all figure that? Um, and then if they're uh, female, that's um, one point as well. So there's a maximum of nine points. And so this score, um, once we have a score of about two, that's when we decide um, that the patient would probably benefit um, from being put on anticoagulation because of the risk of stroke. So each of these scores correlates to um, a risk of stroke. And if you have a patient on warfarin, that reduces the risk of stroke by two-thirds. Um, aspirin reduces the risk of stroke by one-fourth. Um, but another thing to remember when you put a patient on warfarin is that you do have an increased risk of bleed. So you have to use that risk versus benefit in that case. So the higher the score, um, the more likely you're going to put them on warfarin. So some of the anticoagulation um, used for AFib for preventing a stroke um, or MI. Um, warfarin, you still see warfarin a lot. Advantages are that it's easily reversed with vitamin K and it's once a day dosing. Um, disadvantages are that it requires um, INR monitoring. Um, even when the patient's been on it for a while, it's still going to fluctuate because um, the INR can change based on diet and disease state. Um, Xarelto, um, is once a day. Um, it doesn't require monitoring, and clinical studies have shown that it's better at preventing strokes than warfarin. Um, however, the reversal um, is still a little bit unknown, and APCC is listed as the reversal for most of these newer agents. What is APCC? It's activated um, platelet Pro prothrombin, prothrombin complex. Concentrate. Yeah. Concentrate. Is that a PO? No, it's no. not. I mean, preparation. It's usually used in head bleeds and things like that. It's more an ED drug rather than a floor drug. 
Although I just saw where the FDA just came <coughs> out with Prax bind um, for Pradaxa um, reversal, which is an antibody. To be honest, I was writing my note uh, on my hand, so I, okay. I wasn't listening to that last statement. Okay. Is there another presentation so I don't have to write on my oh, hand? Awesome. Thank you. Oh, well, I don't want to take your. I can copy one of theirs when we get back to school. Oh. No, we got. So the advantages of, of the newer agents, Sorelto, Eloquist, and Pradaxa, are mainly that you don't need constant monitoring. So when you have um, somebody with a DVT, either with or without PE, um, you want to try to identify the cause, which is part of workout's triad. Um, so you kind of look for interrupted blood flow causes, could be PVD, um, vascular disease, infection, long periods of inactivity. Um, it could be something like surgery, which would be an injury, or a hypercoagulable state. This could be genetics. Um, it could be pregnancy, drugs, cancer is a common cause, um, smoking. Um, and so if you have somebody with a DVT, they're going to start um, Lovenox treatment dose or heparin drip, drip immediately. Okay, yeah. And usually, um, warfarin will start immediately as well. And we just have um, an example of a heparin drip bag. Just so you get familiar with what it looks like. And we have different um, strengths of one And we'll talk about those in a minute. Let's take those home and... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're real fun. You can yeah. stick them down. So, Lovenox, um, compared to heparin, there's certain advantages. So it comes in the syringe form, so the patient can actually go home <coughs> with self-injection, which makes it nice because if that's the only thing keeping the patient here, they can go home. Um, it does have a lower incidence of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, mm -hmm. also known as HIT, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And monitoring is not needed. Um, disadvantages for Lovenox, you do have to look at the, your renal function in your patient. Um, you will have to renally adjust it. Um, patient compliance and education, you'll have to educate the patient on how to use it, and a lot of people don't like to stay. <coughs> and the longer half-life means that if you need an immediate um, surgery or something scheduled, you won't be able to do it immediately. Like a heparin drip, you can turn off and it's immediately off, and your anticoagulation immediately stops. With Lovenox, you've got that 12-hour window when you're not going to be able to um, schedule a procedure. I have two questions about Lovenox. Have y'all seen a lot of adverse um, reactions to incorrect administration of Lovenox? Have they been locally? You mean like bruising or? Hematomas, anything like that really? A lot of it? So, so the biggest question that, that typically nurses have is what do you do with this type of injection if they have like low platelets already? And uh, some hospitals use a platelet count of less than 100 where they at least make you consider what you should do. Uh, typically, we don't worry about it unless it's less than 50,000. Um, and uh, usually we care more about IM administration of drugs rather than sub-Q. Um, so sub-Q, low platelets, I don't care quite as much as an IM uh, for, for this. But bruising, if you have a, if you have a platelet count of 300,000, um, which shows up as 300 on, on, on the CBC, uh, you can still have bruising. Sure. So, you know, it, you haven't not, seen not really. Anything. I mean, yeah. and it, as long as you're pinching that inch that you guys all hear about and learn about, uh, you're, you're probably not going to be able to get it into the muscle for most people because uh, you guys can't really tell here, but the, the, the needle sizes are so short. Mm -hmm. And uh, so o only your itty bitty people that you're not getting a good inch on you know fortunately I'm blessed to have more than an inch but uh, it, you're, you're gonna get it into the subcutaneous fat pretty easily so usually I don't care is platelet count the only thing that will affect will love not affect ATT um, <laughs> do you guys have an answer to that off the top of your head uh, yeah. we, it, we, we typically tell them that it, it does not it, it doesn't yeah. yeah and and the modification that it makes to the APTT isn't diagnostic of whether the blood is too thick or too thin uh, so we wouldn't use that to kind of gear our, our dosing strategy because as she was about to say uh, it's all strictly weight based dosing like if you have a clot all we care about is what you weigh and right. what your kidney function is right. uh, we don't use 
a blood test to adjust our dose the way we do with warfarin that you right. guys all know about. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. Thank you. So just to kind of show you um, in the pathway where Loganox and heparin work, um, they both work at factor 10 and thrombin. Heparin is a little bit more thrombin than factor 10A, and Loganox is more factor 10A, which accounts for some of their differences. So as we mentioned, for Loganox administration, um, you want to inject it in the subcutaneous fat in the abdomen. Um, it does have an air bubble in it. Um, you don't want to remove that. You want to inject it at a 90 degree angle and go over the patient education with the patient. And then for dosing, for um, a prophylactic dose, it's gonna be 30 milligrams twice a day or 40 milligrams once a day. And the treatment dose is based on the patient's weight. And it's gonna be 1.5 mg per kg once a day or um, a mg per kg twice a day or key day if it's a renal patient. And again, you will usually see um, warfarin started um, as well. If you guys have any questions, stop them, like, constantly. <laughs> so for heparin, um, it's usually begun on patients um, with a new um, pulmonary embolism, with or without DVT as a drip. Um, it's usually switched to Lobinox treatment dose. Um, with heparin, you have to um, get an APTT, and we'll talk a little bit about the heparin protocol in a little while. Heparin has a short half-life, that's why it's a drip. Um, it's a good option for patients with renal dysfunction because you don't have to worry about um, changing the dose. Um, APTT monitoring is required and it does take time to reach therapeutic levels. So warfarin um, is a vitamin K antagonist. It inhibits the vitamin K dependent clotting factors, um, 2, 7, 9, and 10. And so typically it requires 5 to 7 days in order for a patient to become therapeutic. Um, Another thing to be aware of is it also inhibits the endogenous anti-clotting factor, CNS, which is why um, you have a concern for a hypercoagulable state that's possible at first. Meaning what? Um, so that they can actually, the patient can actually get blood clots in areas like the ends of their fingers, um, in fat deposits in women, it can happen in the breast, and it gotcha. looks a lot like frostbite. When you initially start the heparin? It's rare, but it can happen if gotcha. you Google it. It's just more for warfarin. Oh, yeah. sorry, it's not warfarin. It's warfarin. So why are we putting people on warfarin if it takes so long to fight it off as opposed to starting with heparin and just leaving them on that? Because they want to go home and they can take a pill a day with warfarin. And it's fine while they're in the hospital, definitely. But I mean, once they go home, they're gonna to need to take something. They can't be hooked up to a heparin drug. Okay, well, I just but, didn't know if it was like Lovenox to where you could just inject it. So no, I mean, Lovenox is really probably better um, okay. because you don't have the fluctuations like you do with warfarin. You don't have the effects from diet and genetics. And the one case where you would send somebody home on Lovenox injections would be it's like a pregnant patient who was hypercoagulable because you cannot give a pregnant anybody thinking about becoming pregnant you can't give them more it. So you're talking about heparin sub Q as opposed to Lovenox sub Q. Yeah. So so um, Lovenox is by far the mainstay of treatment. Um, so if you weigh 70 kilos, you'd get 70 milligrams twice a day for your blood clot. Uh, heparin sub Q. Uh, for the treatment of blood clots is an unapproved indication by the FDA, meaning that it's been studied, it's been evaluated for, people have used it, has, have used it successfully, including Methodist Germantown physicians. Uh, the dose ends up being quite a bit more than the typical 5,000 BID that you guys, or TID that you see, because those doses are the prophylactic doses. Occasionally, we do send patients home on heparin sub-Q for the treatment of their blood clots but it takes an act of Congress from getting um, uh, the pharmacy to order the drug in the outpatient setting, and um, uh, the concentration is a quite a bit higher concentration because the dose is amped up. Um, so it's been done. The c c circumstances where it happens is patients that have bad kidneys uh, because heparin it doesn't, it's not altered by the kidney function, uh, we can't use Lovenox in those patients, so the option is either sending them home with the sub-Q heparin plus warfarin until the warfarin builds up its effects in the blood and then the heparin stops, or we keep them in the hospital giving them a heparin drip 
and keeping them on warfarin. But length of stay, as you guys know, is is uh, the hospital's So so we, we try to boot patients to the to the home when we can. And if that's all that's stopping them is heparin, or we'll, we'll, we'll try to get them their heparin. The good news is most of the time it doesn't come up. So. Okay. So just to um, indicate where warfarin works in the clotting cascade, it works on these um, four factors: two, seven, nine, and ten, as I mentioned. In each of those factors, those proteins, they have a different half life, which is why um, warfarin takes five to seven days in order to um, have the full anticoagulation effect. <clears throat> so as we mentioned before, there are difficulties with using warfarin. Um, there's no reliable way, not why, um, to determine the initial dose. Um, and the effect is going to be based on genetics <coughs> and diet because a person who eats a lot of salad or kale smoothies is going to have a different um, response to warfarin than somebody who doesn't eat a lot of salad or kale smoothies. Um, I've heard of the kale smoothie. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, they do. Yeah. I agree. Um, drugs, um, the big ones to look out for um, when you're starting warfarin, if you start these drugs, would be amiodarone, um, flagyl, cipro, and cipro. What kind of reactions do those have with it? Um, they're going to cause the INR to go up. Okay, so um, it, it just boosts the coming virtually. Right. It's, it's from an enzyme. Um, it's, it's from blocking an enzyme that it metabolizes warfarin, and so you get more active warfarin. Um, disease states such as um, heart failure, hyperthyroidism, and liver dysfunction can also affect the INR. Um, so we talked about uh, being careful that patients are initially hypercoagulable, and it's where <coughs> you can see um, those effects. And then even when patients are discharged and they're therapeutic, they have to get checked um, monthly or twice a month. What blood test do we check <coughs> for? What? For morphine? INR. INR? GTT for heparin? Mm-hmm. What's the INR goal for coumadin patients? Two to three? Two to Unless they're high risk, then it's 2.5 to 3.5. All right, so what makes them high risk? Those different factors, the age, the comorbidities, all that. So, so those co comorbidities that they were talking about are help make you decide do they need a blood thinner, uh, but that doesn't decide what type of intensity blood thinner, like what INR goal they need. Um, so um, it's mechanical mitral valves, so if they've had a valve replacement in the mitral position, which is between the left atrium and the left, left ventricle, that has a higher INR goal. And then sometimes if patients have atrial fibrillation plus they have an aortic valve, uh, they need a higher INR goal. Um, you guys don't have any nursing students over in the cardiac short stay. Okay. No. So we actually have a patient over in cardiac short stay that we're playing that game on right now. But, okay. but it's only for the mechanical valves if they have a, a bioprosthetic. So that's when they go to the 2.5. Sometimes if, if you have a, if your INR is consistently between two and three, and you have a stroke, which is what we're trying to prevent with warfarin, and we know that it was therapeutic when you had that stroke, sometimes we'll say, well, two to three didn't cut it. Let's move them up to two and a half to three and a half. So if they fail therapy at a lower level, then you may bump up it. But, but typically, just first starts, it, it's two to three for most patients, unless they have that mechanical valve. Okay. So bridging, as we talked about um, earlier, we want to give patients warfarin because it's convenient. It's sending them home with a once-a-day pill. Um, so we're going to transition them from either heparin or Lovenox onto warfarin. And again, this is for matters of convenience rather than clinical reasons. Um, and again, Lovenox is really a more safe and effective um, option for these patients. Um, Erixtra fondoparadox is another option, um, but again, it can't be used in renal dysfunction. So that's is, another one you might see. Is price ever factored into it? Is warfarin and I'm, I'm, a, I'm assuming Lovenox is quite cheap. expensive, yeah. 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 
Yes, yeah, so, so Warfarin's four dollars whether you have insurance or not. Really? So, so, so yeah. that's one of the blessings. Um, Lovenox, uh, I used to think of it if you were paying cash for it, it's a dollar a milligram. Really? <laughs> um, now, it, it, I think the price has come down considerably because that uh, it's now a generic, so, so that helps. But the blessing is most of these patients, we can get them therapeutic on their warfarin mm -hmm. after approximately maybe five to seven days, as she was saying. So usually we only need three or four days of Lovenox in the outpatient setting before they can come off of it. Gotcha. And so even though it's kind of not cheap, yeah. usually it, it's doable. And when you tell them the difference is a stroke, which yeah. can make you uh, mashed potatoes, mm -hmm. or a pulmonary embolism that, that, that can put you in the grave, uh, people come up with money a lot more, and, and I, I hate to I hate to be like that, but you know PEs kill 30 percent of the people, uh, up to 30 percent of the people that have them. Uh, we see them a lot in the hospital setting, and we don't necessarily think of the mortality associated with it because we're seeing the ones that survive. The ones that don't make it to the hospital and just drop dead uh, are the ones that we don't ever see because they come to us uh, in, in bad shape already. So. Um, uh, but you know, it, it it's a necessary therapy for these patients. Right. So. <coughs> so, um, just to go over bridging again, um, this would be the therapeutic dose of Lovenox, the one milligram per kilogram Q12, or the one point five milligram um, per kilogram um, Q day. And so, it's usually going to be dosed daily unless the patient is over one hundred milligrams. And as far as using more than one anticoagulant, other than bridging, you're not going to see it too often, and it should always kind of raise a red flag. The only other time you might see it is if a patient's being converted from one oral anticoagulant to another. But typically, other than bridging, you won't see more than one anticoagulant used. You can use anticoagulants um, with antiplatelet agents. So somebody who has a stent and AFib, um, they might be on warfarin and Plavix and aspirin, and that's okay. That does increase the risk of bleeding, but that's it's perfectly okay for them to be on it. And the main risk of bleeding would be a GI bleed in that case. And so this is just showing you where the, the newer um, oral agents work, um, mostly at factor 10A, Xarelto, mm -hmm. Eliquis, and Erixtra. And then um, Dibigatran works on thrombin. They're coming, up, coming out with so many new ones, it's hard to keep up nowadays. It is. So we're just going to go through some of the other oral um, anticoagulants, and I guess this one's not. Um, so Erixtra um, is a factor 10A inhibitor, and again, you don't monitor, and you have to um, be aware of your renal function in your patients. And I put the doses on there. Um, it's for treatment of DVT and PE and prophylaxis of DVT, and those are the doses. Again. For prophylaxis, you can't use it if you have a patient that's less than 50 kilograms. That's something to be aware of. Um, again, it's an injection. Similar to Lovenox, you've got the air bubble, um, and you can only do a sub-Q injection, not IM. So, i got a question for you guys. Sorry to interrupt. Um, this one is one you guys see fairly frequently. I just had a big abdominal surgery, so I've got midline scar, <coughs> scar, whatever you want to call it, and I want to give my Lovenox shot sub-Q in the abdomen. Is that an issue? Yes. Okay. So then what do you do? The, the order is Lovenox 40 milligram sub-Q, prevent their blood clot. You're the nurse. Physician ordered it. Has Go. no idea how you guys make things happen. How do you make it happen? <laughs> Pick a different spot. Okay. So based on what she said, only abdomen. Uh, she didn't say it on this slide, but one of the other slides says only the abdomen. So what do you do? Make a different spot on the abdomen. Okay, uh, that that's a move out. Okay, so where where do you think you give the shots? Where where have you seen? You guys have probably have you are you guys allowed to give drugs yet? Yes. Okay. <laughs> oh, like I, I, I have no freaking clue. So we're, you, you give the shots where my hands are, right? Normally is where you're supposed to give them. Okay, so I have a big scar here and I have a scar here. So I have a scar right where you want to give it. Where do you give it? Can she do it on the butt handles? Yeah, so you can go a little bit further back. Believe it or not, there's some data for back of the arm and upper thigh, uh, back of the thigh. Um, we don't like to do that. Typically, abdominal surgery, 
isn't necessarily a reason why you can't give it in the abdomen because as long as you're pinching an inch of fat, it's in the subcutaneous space, uh, you're not going to poke their bowel, you're not going to poke anything, but, 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 so just abdominal <coughs> isn't necessarily something that you have to avoid. So, now, if they happen to have scars on both sides, which would be kind of weird, uh, you, you may have to do something, but uh, typically you guys wouldn't want to make that decision without uh, conferring with a, a more uh, graduate individual, whether it's the physician or uh, another nurse, but, you know, so. Good question. So Xarelto um, is an oral anticoagulant. It's also a factor 10A inhibitor. And again, the advantage that monitoring is not required. Um, it's used for treatment of DVTs and PEs, um, secondary prevention of DVT and PE after treatment for six months. And it's also used for post-op prophylaxis and knee and hip replacement, as well as um, prevention of stroke and AFib. So those are all the doses listed there. Do you have a question? So why would everyone want to use Rotho instead of the Warfarin? Magical question. Um, I guess part of it could be expense. Um, I think a lot of people, um, <coughs> some of the patients I've talked to anyway who are on Warfarin um, are a little bit freaked out by the reversal of these newer agents. The lack of reversal agent. Just because it's so easy to reverse warfarin, everybody has vitamin K, you can take a tablet, you can take an IV, but as far as the efficacy of reversal of the newer agents, I mean, it's a huge advantage not to have to have monitoring, but I think it's... No diet, advantage. you know, to watch your diet, drug interactions are limited, but you pay for it at the pharmacy. Uh, so paying more at the pharmacy is balanced with going to the doctor and paying whatever your copay is there. Uh, a young person with insurance where it's your 10, 20, 40 hour copay, I would say sign me up for Zeralto or the next drug that she's going to pop, well, two drugs from now with, that she's going to pop up. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, those would be better in my, my eyes. Um, but right now it's cost. Um, patients that have been on warfarin, so you know, you, you've heard, if it's don't broke, if it's not broke, don't fix it, or uh, that's what he says, that's right. Um, basically, if you're doing okay on warfarin, there's probably no... <coughs> but you have to go to the doctor once a month. But if you have chronic disease states, cardiac issues, diabetes, whatever, you're already going to the doctor. So usually you can kind of fit it in with you're already going to the doctor for whatever reason. So it's not as big of a hassle if all you've got going on is this one, one situation. Um, so, but people are freaked out. Patients, the patients you guys are going to be seeing are freaked out if they've been on warfarin and they're like, man, my doctor knows everything about my warfarin dose. We've been checking it for the last 36 years, and now you're saying I need to change over to Xeralto, and I don't have to check my blood work? That freaks them out that they suddenly are on a blood thinner and there's no blood work. So, you know, the way I explain it to them is warfarin is the weird drug, <laughs> not these new ones. Most drugs don't have a specific blood test to monitor their level. When's the last time you've checked a metoprolol level or a chlorate level? or your metformin level. You don't. So warfarin's the weird drug. And just because it's new and you know it you don't don't necessarily be freaked out. Now you have to pick the right patient population to use then. <laughs> yeah. But but uh but you know, I had to warfarin. talk to you that way. Yeah and, 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 well I mean you, you know the, the the thing about uh being a pharmacist is you guys talking to this is sort of off topic. Me 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 telling patients with they need to hear, I can get away with. You guys get in trouble, physicians get fired and a new physician will come along. I just walk out of their room and I don't have to see them again. So uh, that's, that's a blessing of being a pharmacist. Anyway. But it, but uh, valves, the relative is contraindicated with valves though, I mean, right? Aren't these drugs contraindicated that's, with valves? That's you're thinking of Dibigatran for Daxa. Okay. With the oh really? So the relative can begin with valves, I got you. Apparently I'm Still talking about administration for Xarelto. Um, you can um, you have to give it with food to increase absorption. Um, you can crush it. So if you have a patient with a tube, I guess um, you can mix it with water or applesauce. Um, if you mix it with applesauce, use it immediately afterwards. 
Um, you can use it with an empty tube or feeding tube. So Eloquis, Epixaban, also a factor 10A inhibitor. Again, monitoring is not required. Um, Dosing varies um, by indication. Um, you can administer it without regards to meals, and um, it can be crushed for an NG tube and mixed with D5 water. And so Pradaxa, Dibigatran, this is the one that you're thinking that you don't want to use um, with AFib with valves. Um, but if you just have regular <coughs> AFib, it's fine. Hmm. Um, it's a direct thrombin inhibitor. Monitoring, again, is not required. Um, you want to take it with a full glass of water without regard to meals. You don't want to break open the capsules because this um, increases the concentration, um, the absorption by 75% um, with increased risk of um, side effects. So why wouldn't you want to give that for valves? Because they did um, a clinical <coughs> trial and they had increased risk of bleeding and death hmm. in patients with valves and it's not clear the mechanism why. But the thought is that um, the layers that form over your valves have something to do with your increased risk of bleeding when you're on this drug, basically. But that's strange. They all work in the same part of the clotting cascade. They're kind of all similar well, drugs, is, or no, not this really? This is a thrombin inhibitor. So oh, if you go back to that oh, oh, picture gotcha. I had, it is a little bit different than the rest of them. It's gotcha. a direct thrombin inhibitor, whereas the other, the oral agents and um, Erixtra are I all see. Um, okay. Now, I just got a uh, email uh, two days ago saying that the FDA just approved a reversal agent for the, uh, yeah. for, oh, for, really? for the Pradax, for, for the Pradaxa, which is the, the bigger trend. Uh, we, we still don't use it. it. It's kind of fallen out of favor with uh, physicians for uh, various reasons. Uh, so now I'm just going to give you guys um, an example of a patient with a pulmonary embolism. Um, he's a 50-year-old male with a new diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. He weighs 100 kilograms. He has no renal dysfunction. Um, the following drugs that we have up there, which of the following would not be appropriate? Which one would be a red flag for his condition? There's two still Yeah, there is. Huh. So, so first of all, just for, for, for understanding the purpose, she said <coughs> the Lovenox 150 would be wrong. Why would that be... I, I scoffed at that, so obviously that one's an okay one. So, so why is that one okay? It is okay. It is okay. I thought you said it was 30 milligrams once they are, once they are 40 once they. But isn't the weight based? But remember, there's there's two different doses of lipids. One, one is the prophylactic way. to prevent, and the other one's treatment. Uh -huh. And your treatment one is always going to be just think it's always going to be higher. It's weight based dosing. It's going to be the warfarin. <laughs> oh, it's the afterburn. No. Right. So you, you have the right drug, just pick yeah. the other one. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, the 40. The 40 is so not enough. It's not enough. Right. That would be a prophylactic right. dose. <coughs> and right. so, so just to review, make sure we got this. There's there's primarily two prophylactic doses of Lovenox, 30 milligrams twice a day and 40 milligrams daily. Those are the prophylactic doses. So those are the prevention of clot formation. The second that you have the event, the second you have the clot, we need to step up our game because you now have something that we need to do and so the dose is going to be higher so there's unless your patient happens to weigh 40 kilograms which occasionally happens uh, you, you won't see 40 milligrams as a dose to treat a clot it's always going to usually be that 1.5 milligram per kilogram dose which the, the patient was 100 kilograms mm -hmm. so, 150. so 150 milligrams yeah so it's always going to be typically above doses above 40 milligrams are treatment of a clot. So the trick word there was treatment, not prevention. Yeah. Okay, so we mentioned HIT earlier, and um, HIT is heparin induced thrombocytopenia, and it can happen um, from patients that are treated with Lovenox, heparin, even just heparin flushes. Even if they're only treated with heparin once, it can happen. And so, I'll let, yeah, I'll let I'm going to try to explain that topic and see how this goes. Um, so, for them to have HIT, they have to be exposed to heparin before of some sort. And then they, the body makes antibodies to that and makes a complex. So this complex, um, when they're exposed to it again, it causes the platelets to be removed um, to 
be marked and removed by macrophages, so you get thrombocytopenia. And then it also causes platelet activation, so you get an increase in clots. And then you also get an increase in the signaling that promotes clots, so a double. Um, so that's why you have the thrombocytopenia and the increased clots as well. So it seems is that kind a precursor to DIC sometimes? Uh, or is that kind the of the DIC same is sort of? Oftentimes a little bit different. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. Some, similar, something different. like that. So this is just a figure showing the, the antibody to heparin and so how it's taken. <coughs> just about every person that comes through thinks that heparin induced thrombocytopenia is a bleed risk issue. No. It's gotcha. a clotting issue. So even though your platelets are in the tank, gotcha. you're at risk for clots because of that picture, yeah. that big conglomeration in that bottom corner. Uh, it, it just is that amplified with multiple versions of those stuck together. And so it's this big mass of gunk that can clog up your, ve your, your vessels. <coughs> So um, usually you suspect HIT um, when you know your patients had prior exposure to heparin um, and they have a new onset thrombocytopenia. And um, this doesn't have to necessarily be less than 150,000 platelets. It can be any drop in platelets that great, that's greater than or equal to 50,000. Um, you have the risk of thrombosis, necrotic skin and injection sites. The patient may also experience systemic reactions. So when you say prior exposure, this is typically second dosing somewhere so, along the line. Somehow. So they can have hit over um, after like five to ten days after their initial dose of heparin. Even without a second dose. Okay. Well, they would have it every day. So I mean, it would be like a second dose. I gotcha. So, but you could have had a prior experience, a prior hospitalization, seen heparin, and then That's a subsequent true. hospitalization, okay. you see it for the first time, okay. and you might have hit at that point. If they put a second one. <coughs> so as David mentioned, when you see HIT, you're thinking um, hypercoagulant state, and so you want to treat it with anticoagulants at the treatment dose. So one thing that you can use is a Rickstrom, and that's an off-label use of it. Um, you have to use a treatment dose, and you have to be aware of the kidney function in your patients. So that's one treatment. Um, Argatroban is also commonly used, and then um, as well as